are starting a new series uh, this morning. A number of years ago, I think it was back in 2007, I went through this letter to the Ephesians. And when I picked it up and thought through a couple months ago about where I would go uh, the rest of 2024, uh, this just kind of bubbled to the surface. Um, and so I'd like to begin this morning by the title of my sermon is a li- uh, Ephesians, A Life-Changing Letter. And I would like you to turn there in your Bibles, and we just want to read um, some random verses, um, and, and, and we'll see how they all fit together a little later as we walk through this in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes. Um, but I just want to read, uh, we'll start at the very beginning, chapter 1, then I'll have you turn uh, to pages as we go, um, just to get a, f- a flavor of this letter that is, has been called the treasure house of God, God's riches. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who also lived, um, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature, we were by nature objects of wrath, but <laughs> the contrast. But God, because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God, excuse me, raised up with Christ, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Turn to chapter 4. And notice what Paul calls himself here. Chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Chapter 5. Verse 1, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And using Paul's words, finally, (laughs) chapter 6, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, what we see, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. The last two verses of the letter, 623, peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Wow. Just leave your Bibles open. Let me just pray for us. How precious is your word, our our Father. The older we get, the more we realize its value. We thank you for its precepts clearly stated and purposely defined to give us direction in a world that has lost its way. Thank you also for principles that we may apply even in our time when standards have gotten fuzzy and the future seems intimidating and fearful. We are grateful, Lord, that the entrance of your word gives light. That means a lot to us because there is enormous 
darkness about us today, and we want to live in the light. We want to be able to enjoy what you have, you have for us rather than simply endure. We want to see the beauty of your purposes and how it all fits together in your plan that makes complete sense to you, even though it may not make sense to us. Thank you in advance for what you will speak to us through this letter in the weeks ahead. Thank you for the enormous mercy and compassion and grace that you showed us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We learn from and through your word that it's more blessed to give than receive. And and so, Lord, today we sit here waiting to receive from you. Thank you for this incredible letter. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There are, to- <clears throat> excuse me, there are times when we receive a letter that is so good, we say to a friend or our spouse, you know, I need to frame this letter. It's good enough to be in a frame and, per- and preserved. And preserved. There have been a couple of times where I have in my life received a card or a letter from a family or friend that I wanted to frame because the comments written in them gave me such encouragement. Ephesians is one of those God-framed letters. Had we been living in Ephesus during the first century, I am sure we would have thought upon opening it and reading this letter man, this ought to be framed. This is the one that belongs, I think, in front of our faces for the rest of our days. This is one of those letters that I don't think we'd ever want to forget. I mean, after all, it was written by someone who was unforgettable. Uh, Paul, the one who wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else, The Apostle Paul, who lived a life of enormous sacrifice and commitment, though he began his life in the Lord much later than most. Isn't that interesting? Something about the Spirit's work in the life of Paul and through his pen that um, he was able to put down thoughts that would address our greatest needs and scratch the deepest itches of our lives. The letter to the Ephesians is not only a doctrinally vital link in our faith, but in giving us the foundation for what we believe to be true, but it is full of practical advice, and we'll learn those things in the next weeks and months to come It'll help us not only in our work but in our, in our, and in our social situations, but also in our home and private life as well. The letter talks about a number of things that matter to us, and it won't be long before you say, you know, we should probably frame this. But believe me, in the world in which it was written, it was um, within the not within the context of enjoyment and and contentment. It was written during a time of enormous struggle. Politically and socially, this was during the Roman Empire's greatest days. And the leader of the world was seated in Rome. His name, his title was Caesar. But when this letter was written, Nero was Caesar. Now, you may not know a lot about Nero, but he began his reign in 54 AD, and it ended in 68 AD, which is 14 years of tyranny. His kingdom was evil to the core, and he was a killing machine. Especially, he took delight in killing Christians. Anyone who would not bow the knee to Nero deserved to die. And Christians were notorious for their bowing the knee only to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The more and more Nero learned about that, the more and more he took pleasure in extreme measures of persecution. Most of you are aware that on occasion, the bodies of Christians lit the Colosseum in Rome, while others were torn limb from limb by wild animals as part of the entertainment he provided for the world under his rule. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians in about 62 AD. And if you know anything about Nero's life, you know that he went insane toward the end of his life, burning his own city so that he could recreate it in his image. So the people that received this letter were not only struggling, but they were battling for survival. You'll notice in chapter 1, verse 1, the the first verse of the letter, there's an interesting statement. Paul, who wrote it, calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints. So it's written by Paul, and it's written to Christian believers in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to look more at this next week, but um, just notice the words in Ephesus. Some scholars will tell us that in a few of the best Greek manuscripts, in Ephesus is not in the text. There is a blank in the text. The letter was not just limited to believers in that city. This letter made the rounds around all of the churches in the area, what we know as Turkey, but modern day Asia, uh, ancient day modern um, Asia Minor. It was written to the saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus. There's another uh, reason why scholars say that, and that is what we read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. After this letter was written, um, Paul wrote Colossians about the same time, and we see in, where is my, there it is. We see this in Colossians after To the Colossians, Paul wrote, This letter has been read by you. See also that you read it in the church of the Laodiceans, another of those cities in western Turkey, that you can, and and you in turn need to read the letter from Laodicea. Now that's a modern, I mean, that's a minor detail, I think, but it hints that the letter from the Ephesians was making the rounds, especially coming from Laodicea. When Scottish theologian John Knox was dying, he had one request. And that, that the, and that was that the letter to the Ephesians, along with John Calvin's commentary on Ephesians, would be read to him every day. John R. W. Stott points out that many have thought, have brought, been brought to the faith by the words of this letter, and then Stott in his commentary on Ephesians mentions a man who I never, had never heard of, a man named Dr. John McKay, the former president of Princeton Theological Seminary. And he quotes McKay, who said, to this book I owe my life. In July of 1903, I experienced boyish rapture in the hillands of Scotland. I made a passionate decision to give my life to Jesus Christ among the rocks in the starlight. At age 14, while reading the letter to the Ephesians, the light dawned on me in the starlight. It was, I saw the world anew. Everything was new. I had a new outlook, a new experience, new attitudes of, about other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything. I had been quickened. I was really alive. Following his education, McKay never lost his fascination with the letter to the Ephesians. McKay was invited to deliver the the Crowell Lectures at Edinburgh University, January 1948. He chose the letter to the Ephesians as his topic. 
In those lectures, he referred to the letter of Ephesians as, quote, the greatest, maturest, and for our time, the most relevant of all of Paul's works, for here is the distilled essence of the Christian religion. I say to you without hesitation that if you are not a student of the letter to the Ephesians, you have missed something very important in your understanding of your life as a Christian. Not only have you missed the enormous foundation for the Christian life in the vertical sense with you and God, but you've also missed a large amount of information on how to live horizontally with other people. Ephesians offers both, and it offers it in abundance. And it isn't necessarily bedside reading. Um, But I'm going to challenge you also during the rest of the weeks during 2024 to read the entire letter once a week. It'll take you about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, But I'm going to ask you to do that. And there's a reason for that, and that was a story my father told me. My dad went to Bob Jones University uh, back in the 1950s after the Second World War. And one of his teachers at Bob Jones uh, said this to him, I want you to read it every day. Every day. You'll discover at the end of two weeks that you'll be able to think your way through the letter without looking. And you'll begin to notice at the beginning of the third week that your Bible will automatically open to the letter you've been reading every day. Before long, your mind will be changed as the Word of God, which is active and alive and powerful, will change your perspective, your thinking, so you begin to think like Paul. Before long, you'll find out that your decisions that you make will be filtered through the truths of Ephesians. Before long, the struggles that you are having now will begin to be solved through the truths in the letter to the Ephesians. It will no longer just be print on a page. It will be a letter written in your heart. Now, Ephesus is still a a city that you can visit today. There are few places more impressive than Ephesus. Marble columns that have been restored are some of the most impressive that you could ever witness. The structures are breathtaking. I've never been there, but I have friends who have been there. There's an outdoor theater that's been restored that seats 24,000 people. It's the very place where Paul was in Acts 19. Unlike Corinth or Athens or Philippi, Ephesus was unique in that it held the temple of the the goddess Diana. And that temple being restored is one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Dates back to 550 B.C. She is called the goddess mother of everything. And Ephesus was a city of enormous superstition that, was, that revolved around the worship of Diana or Artemis, as uh, the, our Old Testament Bible refers to. But back to Ephesians. Um, I'd like you to turn from here, stick your finger here, and go to Acts chapter 18. Uh, I, I want to uh, do something that will make you smile, uh, for those of you who know me uh, a little bit. Um, On the screen are the missionary journeys of Paul. Um, You'll see that there's a legend in the very bottom, and you can see the the different journeys. Three of his journeys were voluntary. Once he decided to take himself, one wasn't. And that's when he went to Rome. You'll see that it all started in Antioch and then went through that region we note as today as Turkey or Asia, Asia Minor. If you go as far as you can in Asia, 
you come to the city of Troas, where then he jumps from Asia over to what we know today as Greece. He jumps the Aegean and goes to Greece. Traveling across there, he comes to that region called Macedonia, where the city he visits the cities of Philippi and Neapolis and Berea. He comes down the coast to Athens and then ends up in Corinth. And when you run into Corinth, that's where he is in Acts chapter 18. Look at 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla. Amazingly, the Lord in his providence brings someone to Corinth who is in the exact same profession as Paul. Because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because Paul was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. <clears throat> this is before Nero. This is when Claudius is ruling in Rome, and he drives the Jews from Rome, and this couple ends up in Corinth. <coughs> Excuse me. Look across the page at verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, about a year and a half. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, Verse 19, they arrive at Ephesus. Now look up at the map again. So they were in Corinth. They go down to Sancria, which is the port town for Corinth. And then they sail directly east across the Aegean and come back to Ephesus. They arrive in Ephesus. And then 19 says, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. Paul didn't found the church in Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila did because he leaves. Verse 19, he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. They asked him to spend more time with them. He declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's the Lord God's will. And he set sail from Ephesus. Again, go back to the map. So he set sail and returns to Jerusalem. Okay? And then he heads back to Antioch, which is home base for him. From there, the third journey begins, and he goes back to Ephesus. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Now, Again, how could there be disciples there if Paul had left? Well, these are actually Jewish disciples who had come from Alexandria in Egypt. Look at verse 2. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Their answer is fascinating. No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So these Jews who had come to Ephesus, brand new, Paul engages these Jews, and he asks them a question based on what we're going to learn in the letter to the Ephesians, the truth about the body of Christ, and how the moment that you are saved, you trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and lives there permanently for the rest of your life, empowering you to live a life pleasing to God. They hadn't even heard of him. Look down at verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue. He was there before, but this time it's on the third journey. And he spoke boldly for three months. He was a guest preacher before. Now he's actually going to hang around for a while. He spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. I have the way underlined in my Bible. Reason being is that during the first century, those who had trusted Jesus were called followers of the way. Where did, where did that come from? John 14, 6. 
when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. So it became the followers of Jesus became Noah's members of the way. Okay? Look down at verse 9. So Paul left them, now he's leaving again, and took the disciples with him and had discussions. They left the synagogue, went over to, it says, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. There's a whole other tangent I could go down. It would take another 20 minutes. <coughs> well, I'll leave that for another day. And this went on for two years. Why is that such a big deal? Because Paul... Although he founds churches, he's always on the move. But here he stays in Ephesus for three years, building up the church at Ephesus. So much so, verse 10, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia, think, now, think about this. Think about how the, the Spirit of God through the voice box of Paul, a, a, an amazing Jewish Pharisee who came to know Jesus as the Messiah, the second member of the Trinity, God, he is so persuasive that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even, this is where the Christian television people get this, that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. The apostles had the, the, the there were 14 of them. I don't know if you knew that. Um, 14 apostles. Judas kind of was in, he went AWOL. And so they replaced him with Messiah, Matthias, that was 13, and then there was Paul. One of the prerequisites to be an apostle was you had to see the risen Christ. There are no apostles today, just in case you wonder. I know there are some that call themselves apostles. They're not apostles. Okay, Bill Johnson, Bethel, no. He's not an apostle. But the amazing thing happens is that through the Apostle Paul, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit are his that he uses to validate exactly what he's claiming, he's teaching from the script, Old Testament Scriptures. Jump to Acts 28. Everything here, we could stay longer, but we need to keep moving. It's, i got a ways to go yet. Now, Look up at the map again, okay? Acts 28, Paul is on his way to Rome. He has been arrested by the Jews. He's been in jail for two years. He appeals to Caesar. Now he's sent back to Rome to await trial before who Caesar? Nero, the man who hates Christians, okay? So he travels across the Mediterranean. There's a shipwreck. He finally arrives at Rome. Paul's an older man now. He's probably 60. And then we read these verses, Acts 28, verse 30, for two whole years. So he spent two years in Caesarea in jail. Now he spends another two years under house arrest in Rome. So he's in jail for four of the ten, his last 10 years on this earth. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's under house arrest. He can't escape, but neither can the soldiers. <laughs> he has a captive audience in a very literal sense. And even though he's under house arrest, people come, he meets with people, he shares the gospel with the soldiers. He's also writing. There are four letters that he wrote of the New Testament during his house imprisonment. Ephesians is one of them. Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians is the other three. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 4, chapter, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, as a prisoner of the Lord. He is. Literally, a prisoner. 
But he calls himself in chapter 6, verse 20, an ambassador in chains because he is in chains. Charles Ryrie wrote this, knowing that they would not get a verdict of guilty, his accusers probably never showed up and therefore lost the case by default. Paul would have been released from house arrest and become free to engage in the ministry reflected in the pastoral epistles before being released, uh, excuse me, rearrested and then finally martyred. That means that we, what we have here is the case where Paul is under arrest, he's freed, he travels, but then as Nero goes crazy between the years of 62 to 67, he is free and he writes 1 Timothy and other letters, uh, Titus, uh, he's rearrested, brought to Rome, and then is martyred by Nero. You know what's really interesting? Is how today we name our dogs Caesar and our sons Paul. In those days, they named their sons after the Caesars. How, how interesting things changed. Well, enough of the map and all that, okay? Um, let's look at the structure of the letter a little bit. On your insert, I did give you a little uh, <coughs> graphic. <clears throat> um, if if you are, your eyesight's like mine and you want a big one, um, I got one. Okay, that little thing is way too small for me to read. Uh, so if you want one, I got a handful of them up here. You can come get them. Um, only because I, I can't read that small print. But... Uh, um, let's just look at the, this chart for a little bit, just so we can see the layout of the landscape. Um, chapters 1 through 3 is our position in Christ. Okay? Our position in Christ. Full three, uh, three full chapters that turn our attention heavenward. Think of it as the vertical part of the letter to the Ephesians. Anytime we read any part of the first three chapters, we should think of an arrow pointing heavenward and an arrow pointing earthward. This is the vertical relationship we have with Christ. Our focus is on God, what God has done for us in chapter 1, what Christ has done in us, chapter 2, and the whole story of the mystery of the body of Christ in chapter 3. God's work in and among Jews and Gentiles alike, bringing us together into one body, which is the revelation God gave to the Apostle Paul. Chapter 1 emphasizes God's sovereignty. And if you question that, listen to these words. <laughs> Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us. Sovereignty. Again, an arrow coming from heaven to earth. Not what we do for God, but what God does for us. Verse 6, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And I'll unpack this in the weeks to come. Don't save your questions, okay? To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Somebody give me an amen for crying out loud. Amen. There you go. The Spirit of God inspires the pen of Paul who could sit and write some of the most deep theological truths found anywhere in the New Testament. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he, my favorite word, lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will. We'll talk about the musterion of God. That's the Greek word for mystery. The mystery of his will, uh, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is all around the subject of reconciliation, where God made things right between himself and mankind by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's what... Christ Jesus does for us at the cross. 
couple sections. Verse 1 of chapter 2, as for you, you were dead in your tra- contrast. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God. Isn't that great? Verse 11, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who called themselves the circumcision. Verse 12, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, but God, verse 4, but Christ, verse 13. It's a chapter of contrast. And it tells us what Christ Jesus has done in us. Chapter 3 puts it all together in Christ. Into one body so that we walk arm in arm with one another in harmony, in harmony and unity. That's the part of the letter um, we speak of so much as, as the foundation of our faith. Because you can't build your life without the proper foundation. And we find that our position in Christ, that's our foundation. Chapters 4 through 6 is our practice on earth. Chapter 4 talks about walking in the light and putting on this good theological foundation to work. Verse 4, chapter, verse 2, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I got to drink of water. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, Bearing with one another in love. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We don't create unity. We work at keeping it. (laughs) What do we do? We destroy unity. We have to work to maintain what God has done. Now, four through six isn't confusing. One through three can be a little confusing. This is stuff that we can understand. Chapter 4 focuses on the walk of the prisoner. It emphasizes humility and unity and maturity and honesty and harmony. And if you wonder how a believer is to live, read chapter 4. If you still don't know, read it again. If you still are confused, read it a third time. Chapter 5 looks at the life of the imitator. Now, why would I say that? Because Paul says it in verse 1 of chapter 5. Be imitators of God. Now, wait a minute. You're thinking to yourself, but I can't imitate God. I know that. So does God. So he commands me to do what I can't do? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He commands that you, you to do what you can't do, so you will trust him to do it through you, what you can't do. It's not rocket science. We make it way too difficult. Why? Because we're so doggone capable. And we think we got to do something for God. No, we don't. We have to hear, we have to believe, and we have to submit to the truth of it, and let him do it through us. I'm a wonderful husband. I am. Just ask my wife. But you think I do that? She knows I don't do that. She was married to the tool that she, you know, said yes to 43 and a half years ago. She remembers him. I'm not wonderful because I'm so wonderful. I'm wonderful because God's amazing. And he has lavished his grace on me and transformed me by his word. I'm I'm, I'm not that nice a guy left to myself. And don't look at me with that like that. (laughs) You're the same. I know that. Chapter 5 lays out some things that we're to do. Verse 18, don't get drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Wait a minute. I thought the Spirit at the moment of, yes. 
This word filled means controlled by. Not top down, but from inside out. How are we filled with the Spirit? How are we to do that? Can I do that in my... No. How are we supposed to do that? We'll get there. Okay? We'll get there. I promise. It's a mystery to me how we are filled with the Spirit. And yet, we can be controlled by Him as we cooperate with Him. Don't fight Him. We'll talk about that later. We'll get there about October. Okay? Okay? Verse 19, chapter 5. And when we're filled, when we're controlled by the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit, we submit to Him, and He's working His way out in us, what do we do? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks. Always giving thanks. Did you hear it? Always giving thanks. He says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Give thanks always. This is the will of God for you in Christ. Now, he didn't say give thanks for all things. He says give thanks in all things. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's the outworking of the filling of the Spirit. Then he talks about wives being submissive to the husbands and the husbands living the kind of lives that would make a wife want to do that. Okay? All leads to harmony between parents and children. Tell me of another letter that has this kind of depth of teaching. Only Ephesians. Colossians is like it, but Ephesians. Chapter 6 highlights the life of a warrior. And this is where it gets dark. We read verse 10 earlier. We move into the world that we often shudder about, the demonic realm. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We step into the presence of demonic forces and we are to stand firm. How do we do that with the armor of God on? (coughs) And we learn about that in this letter to the Ephesians. And when we fight him, there uh, uh, there are two Offense, every piece of the armor of God is defensive except for two. The sword of the Spirit and prayer. That's why the ministry of prayer of the local church is so essential. If you go back, and and we'll do this, but if you go back to Acts chapter 2 when the Jerusalem church is, is established, they do four things. We've done three of them this morning. We've had fellowship, we have prayed, we have listened to the word. That's what we're to do as a church. Look at verse 18. And pray in the Spirit. We'll talk about that. On all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Let me give you three thoughts and I'll be done. You can fill these out on your outline if you want. First is a reminder, then a relief, then a reassurance. The reminder, we are all under the headship of Jesus Christ as Lord, so we are to be submissive. Well, Scott, it's hard for me to submit. Duh. It's hard for all of us. We are to learn to be submissive, and we'll learn that as we study Ephesians. Relief, we belong to a body. So we need to be committed to the Lord and to each other. When I got married, my priority was God and Heidi Myers. Then we had children. My priority was God, Heidi Myers, my children. Then my children got married. God, Heidi Myers, my children and their wives then they had grandchildren. God, okay, you get it? There is a priority structure we are to follow. We are to be submissive to the Lord and then to one another. Christianity is not a Lone Ranger sport. Well, I I just do 
just me and God. I do my faith, just me and the Lord. And, and I worship out in nature. Great. Do that Monday through Saturday. And then Sunday, you're to be together. Christian faith is a communal faith. It's not the Lone Ranger. I used to love watching the Lone Ranger. But I felt so bad for Tonto. Because the Lone Ranger didn't know how bad he needed Tonto. So are we. I have some Tontos. And I need them. I submit to them. And I'm committed to them. Reassurance, we must stand against the assault of our enemies. Thus, we need to become equipped to utilize our resources. You have resources in Christ that you can't even imagine. But if you try to Lone Ranger it, you're going to die. Your faith will die. You need to be encouraged. You need to be equipped. My job, according to Ephesians chapter 4, is to equip you, the ministers of God, for your ministry. That's my job. You are the ministers. I say this all the time. You are the ministers of Northwest Bible Church. You are the ones that are going to connect with people out there that need to hear, need the light in this dark world. Now, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm not talking to you because you have no light. You have no light. One way to get the light, trust what Jesus did for you as being enough. Now, we're going to talk about election in a couple weeks. You're going, November? No, no, not that election. We're talking about God's choosing. We're going to, we're going to wrestle with that for a while. But you know what? You're chosen. If you haven't trusted him, what are you doing? Trust him. Allow him to come in and transform your mess. Because yeah, I love you all, but you're all a mess. I know that. We're all broken pots. Okay? You're a sinner. Christ saves sinners. He paid the penalty for your sin. Trust him. Let him shower you with his blessings. God is love. He wants to love you, but he has to adopt you into his family. He adopts you when you say yes. Say yes today. Father, thank you again for this letter. Thank you for the opportunity we have to have it in our hands. Lord, thank you for its life-changing message. Give me wisdom on how to unpack the incredible, lavish truth that's here. Thank you that it's been preserved for us so we know how to live in Christ that we may know the riches that you have for us, that we may take advantage of the storehouse of wealth that you have for us in Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we are heir, co-heirs with Christ and everything that's his is ours. And Lord, open our minds to its truth. If there's anyone here, Lord, that has not trusted you as personal savior, I pray for the hounds of heaven to make them miserable until they bow the knee to Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.